Okay. Uh, should I start? Uh, I will say something before. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone, to start this. Even today, I hope we have a good mood for this event will be Rose Mutley. We have Mr. Musabir Hassan from the Kodi International University as lecturer, Department of Software Engineering. Yeah, and I hope this event will be enjoyable and worthy of knowledge. Yeah, maybe for the next uh, for session today, we will listen presentation from Mr. Musabir and then continue with Q&A session and in the last session we will take a picture together. Yeah, thank you for Mr. Musabir Sangmat. Maybe you can start for this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Novita. Uh, hello, everyone. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon. I am Musabi Hassan. And the topic of today's lecture is explainable AI in health sector. And before that, I want to give a brief description about my background that I completed my bachelor in biotechnology and genetic engineering. And then I completed my master's in data science and analytics from University of Science Malaysia. So that's also, I hope we'll add something new today. So I'm sharing my screen. So before we continue our lecture, I uh, just want to do a little survey from you because uh, before uh, giving a lecture, I want to understand uh, who are my audience. So uh, depending on that, I can uh, arrange my lecture or uh, select the level of my uh, content. So. For that, I would be really happy and it would be very helpful for me if you just kindly scan this QR code and or you can go to www.menti.com and enter this code and just fill up some little survey. I just want to know uh, how well uh, comfortable you are with some uh, topics like machine learning, programming, etc. So you can just scan this QR code or go to this www.menti.com and enter this number and you will be given a survey form. It's very easy, it will just take one minute, but I will have an understanding of uh, the audience. Thank you. So if anyone else is interested in filling up this survey, I hope uh, you will do it. Just scan this QR code or go to www.menti.com and fill this code and just fill up the survey. Okay, maybe only four or six of you have uh, filled up the survey. And from that, I can see you are very uh, good at programming and Python scientific libraries, but uh, not everyone has some knowledge in linear regression decision tree or actually the machine learning algorithms. Uh, that's okay, because in today's lecture, I will uh, start everything from scratch. I mean, there is absolutely no prerequisites. Okay, so let's start. And I have, uh, I have some hands-on programming for uh, this session. And for that, you will be requiring a uh, Python programming language. And I suggest you download Anaconda individual edition uh, because the hands-on will be uh, much later after the theory. So you will have enough time to install this uh, software. Uh, I hope you everyone uh, know what is Anaconda or Python. 
And this is the two library that we will use. So in short, you will just have to install Anaconda individually uh, edition if you want to uh, perform the hands-on. And I will share the file to the data and ports that I will be showing you uh, in the chat box. So it's a, a Google uh, Drive link and you can uh, just simply download this file. There is one data file and the code that I will be showing you. So if you install this library, uh, install this uh, Python and the libraries, you will uh, just, uh, you can perform the labs uh, that I will show you. So I, I think it will be effective. So that's all. Now we will uh, go to our topic. Uh, firstly, some basic uh, knowledge about AI statistics or machine learning and what is what. So. Broadly speaking, AI refers to some artificial intelligent agent. I mean, that can mimic us or us like humans, but uh, actually that kind of system is not really attainable or not really practical. So what we actually do in this sector of artificial intelligence is that we actually perform uh, several machine learning tasks. Now, what is machine learning? Machine learning is actually some tasks that are very easy for our, us humans, but the things that we can automate. So if you think about like this, that AI is actually very broad field. Uh, there are many things under this AI sector and machine learning is just a little part of this AI. So it's not very practical to achieve an overall artificial intelligent agent, but that's why we try to automate smaller tasks individually so, uh, so that uh, I mean, we can save our time or we can uh, predict something or do something uh, more accurately that our human brain cannot do. And on the other hand, statistics actually are more engaged in exploring the relationship between different kinds of variables. For example, if you have multiple data, for example, you have a data like uh, a cholesterol uh, level of some patient, or suppose you have some data like uh, the heart rate. I'll give you some very small and naive examples to make it understand. And you have a corresponding target called, um, suppose heart disease. So what statistics will try to do is to figure out, is there any relationship between cholesterol and heart disease and how significant those relationships are? Or is there any relationship between heart rate and heart disease. If there is some relation, how significant are they? So statistics deals with these kind of things. But uh, on the other hand, what machine learning does is that it tries to predict something for the future. Suppose you have some uh, data of multiple patients, like someone's uh, cholesterol level is 220, their heart rate is uh, suppose 150, and yes, they have heart disease. And some other patient has suppose cholesterol level of 190, uh, heart rate of uh, 75, and they don't have heart disease or maybe they didn't develop any kind of heart disease. So if you have this kind of data, what machine learning tries to do is that given any new data, suppose some patients come to your hospital and uh, uh, they measure their cholesterol level and heart rate and they find out that their cholesterol level is 215 and uh, their heart rate is suppose 90. And the task of machine learning will be to predict whether they will develop uh, any heart disease or not. Yes or no. That is the task of machine learning. So these differences are very important when we are trying to do any machine learning task. Statistics just uh, cares about is there any relationship between these variables and our target. But one thing that we uh, define in our machine learning uh, section that what we are trying to do actually is trying to predict the possibility of developing heart disease based on this data, cholesterol and heart rate. So we call these the features. We call this data the features, cholesterol and heart rate. These are the features of our data. And depending on these features, we are trying to predict whether they will develop heart disease or not. That is, we call this the target. What is our target? We are trying to classify whether they will develop heart disease or not. Sometimes we call them labels. These are just terms and definition that we will use later. So then 
this is the overall uh, difference between statistics and machine learning. And then there is some classification within machine learning. For example, uh, here the example that we saw is that we are trying to predict between two classes. That means whether they will develop a heart disease, yes or no. These are two qualitative variables, yes, no. So when we are trying to predict some classes or some discrete values like this, we call this machine learning task a classification. It's uh, because we are uh, trying to classify two different classes. But in other cases, we may do something different. For example, in other cases, uh, maybe we will try to predict uh, some other target, for example, uh, uh, maybe in some other cases, we will use heart and heart disease, these two as the feature, and we'll try to predict the level of their cholesterol. Uh, see the difference in here, we are trying to predict some quantitative variable. So this kind of task is called regression. So broadly speaking, machine learning tasks can be divided into two parts. In some cases, we are trying to predict some discrete classes. This task will be called classification. And in other cases, we will be trying to predict some values, some numbers. That task will be called regression. And the overall thing that we are doing that we are showing our computer some features like cholesterol and heart. And we are asking our computer to learn from this data and learn to predict the possibility of developing heart disease. So this kind of task or this kind of algorithm is called supervised algorithm. Supervised machine learning algorithm, because here we are first showing our computer some data. We are asking them to learn from this data. Uh, in other words, we are supervising our computer to learn something. And in this kind of supervising learning algorithm, we, you will need some features and a corresponding target to predict that thing. And there is some other kind of uh, machine learning algorithm, which is called the unsupervised learning. In unsupervised learning, uh, we are not trying to actually predict anything. What we are trying to do is classify similar type of data. For example, if we have a data set like uh, heights and weights of some uh, patients, uh, uh, sorry, this one will be weights. And is the data, if the data set is like this, here is some data, here is some data, here is some data. So what unsupervised learning algorithms tries to do is to, uh, group together similar kind of data. For example, here is a natural grouping in this data set. And these patients might be those whose height is low and weight is low. Uh, maybe they are normal, but uh, this group of patients, uh, you see their height is, they are more taller, but their weight is little low. So maybe they are underweight. They are different kind of groups of patients. And you see this, there is a, another uh, natural grouping. Uh, they are uh, they are much shorter, but their height is uh, their weight is much more. So maybe they are overweight. So in data set, uh, sometimes we find these kind of natural groupings. And the task of this unsupervised learning algorithm is to find this kind of patterns hidden in the data. And these are two dis uh, distinction between two kinds of machine learning algorithms. So if I summarize again, uh, in statistics, especially in the health sector, we are mainly interested in uh, establishing some uh, relationship between these features and our target. And we try to identify uh, how strong that relationship is. But in machine learning, we are trying to predict some future events. And if that uh, target that we are trying to predict is discrete or some qualitative value, some text or this kind of things, then we call it classification. And if we are trying to predict some numerical value or some numbers, we call it uh, regression. And there is some other kind of uh, machine learning algorithm that is supervised. This is a supervised algorithm because we are showing our computer some data and giving them some target and we are asking them to learn from it. But in unsupervised, we are not showing them any target. We are just giving them this data and we are asking them to uh, group together the similar type of data. That's all or that's a uh, very gentle introduction to what is AI statistics and machine learning and what type of machine learning algorithms are there.
So in today's lecture, uh, we will be mainly interested in uh, learning uh, several uh, machine learning techniques. For example, if we review the topics of our agenda of today's uh, uh, lecture, uh, we will mainly learn what is decision tree and how we can classify something using decision tree algorithm. We will learn briefly about some uh, ensemble learning techniques. What is ensemble learning? I will show you it later. And some ensemble learning techniques like bagging random forest. Then we will see how to train a model, some best practices of training a model. We will know how to, uh, what is train test validation, why we do these things, what is stratification, what is cross validation and why it's important. Then we will see how we can evaluate our model. And finally, the another part of our today's agenda, that is how we can explain our model, how we can show our stakeholders that our model is actually learning what we are, we want them to learn. So that is overall our agenda today. And that's why I will start with decision tree algorithm. So I will try to keep uh, everything very simple. So what is decision tree and how it, it can predict something or how it can classify something? So to simply say, decision tree simply asks some question to your data. And depending on the answers of that question, uh, they classify your data. For example, here I have a very simple uh, naive data set. For example, here the feature is whether some people wear masks or not. And the target is whether they will develop COVID in the near future. So maybe someone collected this data that uh, for the first uh, patient or for the first person, uh, he always uh, wear masks and he didn't develop any COVID. And for the second person, he also wear masks all the time, but he developed COVID. And like this, this is our data set. And our task is to uh, predict for some future person. Uh, or develop a machine learning algorithm that will uh, predict <clears throat> so like I said, uh, decision tree simply asks some question to it, your data. Now this example might uh, seem very uh, funny or my, uh, might not seem very important, but that's not the important part of this uh, lecture. Uh, I have deliberately kept it very simple so that you can understand the theory behind decision tree learning. Uh, so like I said, decision tree first ask your uh, features some question here. Uh, since there is only one feature, so we don't have nothing much to ask. So we just ask whether some person wore mask or not. So if the answer is yes, you see uh, in the cases where they wear mask or mask, in these cases, two out of uh, two, there is total three person. And out of this, uh, two person was healthy and one person developed COVID. So the decision tree works like this if some new person comes and say that uh, he wears mask that means wears mask is equal to yes decision tree algorithm will traverse through this tree first it will ask did he wear mask yes so he will come to this node and in this node two out of three people are healthy that means if you take the probability two out of three uh, it will be maybe like 0 0.66 or something that is the probability of being healthy is more than being unhealthy or being infected with COVID. So we will just predict that if he wear mask, we, our machine learning algorithm will predict that yes, uh, he will be healthy or he will not develop any uh, COVID infection. And, but if uh, the answer was no, that he didn't wear mask. So this decision tree algorithm will go from this root node to here, this node, this child node. And in this child node, you see zero out of two people are healthy. I mean, all of these people develop COVID. So there is a 100% chance that he will develop COVID. So our machine learning algorithm will just predict that yes, he will develop a COVID. So this is very uh, basic overview of how decision tree algorithm actually works. And it's not that uh, this works for only this kind of qualitative data or text. It can work for uh, quantitative data also. For example, here I have uh, given another uh, simple example. Uh, this feature is the uh, blood oxygen saturation level. And this is uh, the target that whether this person had COVID or not. So the person for uh, whose uh, oxygen saturation level is 96, he didn't have COVID. Whose uh, SpO2 was 82, he had COVID. 
who was 89, he didn't have COVID. So this is the data. And our task is to make a machine learning system that can predict whether someone has COVID or not based on the value of this feature, blood oxygen saturation level. So we can ask this kind of question that if some new people come or new patient come uh, before uh, COVID testing, uh, it's very easy to measure the blood oxygen saturation level. So maybe you measured their oxygen level and so you found out that their oxygen saturation is 85. And if this is our algorithm or decision tree, our decision tree will just ask this first question. Is their uh, uh, oxygen saturation level is less than 90? If yes, it will go to this node. And if no, it will go to this node. Since the oxygen saturation level is 85, so in this, uh, they will, uh, the decision tree algorithm will go to this node. And in this node, uh, one out of four people are healthy. That means 75% of the people uh, have COVID. So it's very possible that this patient whose blood oxygen saturation level is 85, he will, he actually have a COVID. So our algorithm will predict positive. That means he has COVID. But suppose some patient comes whose uh, saturation level is 95. And so th in the first question, uh, it's not smaller than 90, it's greater than uh, 90. So our algorithm will, will take them to this node and in this node one out of one people is healthy that means 100 percent people are healthy so that means our algorithm will predict no definitely he is healthy not infected with covid so uh, like i said decision tree algorithm also works with uh, also works when the features are quantitative and it also works when our target is quantitative that means in these two examples we are actually uh, doing a classification task we are uh, trying to uh, classify something but uh, here we are uh, it's very uh, I mean it doesn't maybe it won't make sense for this example but uh, again I just kept it very simple so in here what we are trying to do is that we are uh, thinking it as a feature whether they wear smarts or not and depending on this feature we are trying to predict their oxygen saturation level now obviously in real life this will never work but I'm just uh, showing you an example of uh, here uh, we are trying uh, to predict some quantitative value. That means here our decision tree algorithm is actually performing a regression task. So how we are going to do that? So similarly, we are uh, like previously, we are asking a question first, whether some patient wears mask or not, if yes. You see, if the answer is yes, and for the answer, uh, for all the answers who wear mask, we will just take the average of the SpO2 value. So the average of SpO2 value is 92, 95, 98. So we will just predict that uh, the uh, patients who wear masks, their SpO2 value will be 95. And if the answer is no, if they don't wear masks, so the patients, according to our data, the patients who don't wear masks, they have SpO2 values like 75 and 90. So we'll predict, our machine learning algorithm will predict that their SpO2 value will be the average of these two. That will be 82.2. So that's that that's how uh, our decision tree algorithm can uh, work with both qualitative feature and quantitative feature and it also can perform uh, classification task and regression task so that's why decision tree is very powerful and in reality this kind of tree based algorithm especially decision tree is still uh, the state of the art algorithm uh, for uh, modeling this kind of tabular data. Now for images or videos or texts, uh, maybe artificial neural networks are not state of the art, but uh, in this kind of tabular data, uh, decision tree can still beat deep learning algorithms. So it's uh, very powerful and also very easy to learn. So now that we have, uh, actually, if you want to ask me any question, I think you should directly speak because all the time I'm looking at my screen, so I may be not be able to uh, look at the chat screen. So it's okay, you just interfere me and directly ask me a question. Okay, uh, so now that we have learned what is decision tree, what can decision tree algorithm do for us? And uh, now, so we will, uh, try to see how we can build a decision tree algorithm and before we try to do that we have to understand some few concepts uh, the first of which is node purity so what do we understand by node purity you see in the uh, yes please
I think somebody raised a hand. If you want to say something, you may ask me a question. Well, maybe uh, for Q and uh, question, maybe you can answer ring of the presentation, sir. Oh, okay, in the Q and session. Okay, thank you. Maybe so. Okay, so now we will try to understand what is node purity. Now, if you uh, think about this uh, model in the right side, uh, I have uh, this is very generic digital learning tip uh, in the root node. Maybe we have asked some kind of question. We doesn't. We don't care what is the question is. But the thing is, after asking that question and after dividing our root node in this two child node, you see what happened to this node. In this node, out of two samples, there is only two samples. Two of them are healthy, and none of them has has COVID. So we call these nodes uh, pure nodes because in this node there is only one type of class, only healthy. There is no uh, COVID or other classes. Similarly, in this node, you see out of these three samples, all of them have, uh, have COVID. There is no healthy patient. So this node is also pure. It has a similar type of, uh, Aska. Wait, 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 just a moment, please. I think something happened to my screen. Just a moment, please. I will call operator first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe you can stop share screen and share screen again. Sure. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, is it visible now? I hope so. Yeah, sure. Is okay. it invisible? Okay, so as I was saying, so this node, so as I was saying, so this node is actually pure because there is only one type of class, sorry. This node is also pure because there is only one type of class, but this node you see is not pure because in this node, there is one healthy and two COVID. This node is also not pure because in this node, one healthy, one COVID. So why do you care, we do care so much about this kind of node purity? Uh, because if you see what is happening actually, Uh, are you also seeing this kind of line in my screen? Um, Aska, maybe you can keep the line. Maybe you can share screen again. So this is. Is it some kind of bug or what? So let's try again. So why do we care so much about this kind of node purity? That's because uh, suppose this is our model, suppose. Now we have asked some question here, but after that question, suppose the answer is yes. And the answer leads us to this node. And 
what are we going to predict? Because here one is healthy and one is COVID. Now there is a 50-50 chance of happening of both. So we cannot predict anything for sure. Same is here. Uh, here is one healthy and two COVID. So maybe there is a 33% uh, uh, chance of being healthy and COVID. But if we uh, made this algorithm like this, where each node is pure, each child node is pure. So if our question was yes, there, is a, there was a 100% chance that our patient will be healthy. Similarly, if the question is no, there will be 100% chance that our patient will have COVID. So that's why we want our child nodes to be pure as much as possible so that our prediction becomes 100% accurate. If not 100%, at least near 100% accurate. So that's the idea behind node purity. But uh, we can understand how pure a node is or is not by simply looking at uh, this, uh, this picture, but how we are going to make our computer understand this thing. So to make our computer understand these things, we have some metrics or some measurements uh, to measure this node purity. So there is three measurements that you can use. One is called the Gini index, and that is called the entropy, and another is called the gain ratio. In this lecture, I will be mainly uh, teaching you this uh, Gini index because uh, what I have learned so far is that uh, this three doesn't really matter. I mean, uh, there is not enough performance gains if you use entropy instead of Gini or use a gain ratio instead of Gini. So these three are almost the same. And this is the equation uh, for measuring the impurity. So I will just explain briefly what this is. You see, this is one minus summation of j over p of j square. So the j is the number of classes. This is the number of classes in your node. So if you think uh, about this node, the first one, there is only two classes, healthy and COVID. And this p of j whole square, this is the probability of that class. Probability of that class. Uh, now, if we, if we measure uh, the Guinea index for this node, what will happen? The, the first line or the first element of the equation is one. So one minus summation of uh, from J equal to one to two. That means first we will think about our first class that is healthy. And the probability of being healthy is actually two by two. If you recall how to cal calculate probability, you just uh, in the denominator, there will be the total number of events, total number of events, or in this case, the total number of samples. We have actually only two samples in this node. And in the numerator, there will be uh, the number of events that we are interested in. So we are interested in measuring the probability of being healthy. So number of time this occurs is also two. So two by two. So there is a 100% chance. The probability of being healthy is 100% uh, or one. 100%, that means in the case of probability is one. So it will be one minus one whole square minus, then we will measure the probability of the second class. So its value is zero. So it will be like zero by two, which will be already zero. So that will be zero square. So if we sum them up, the result will be zero. So the Gini index of this pure node is actually zero. Now, if we measure the Gini index of this node, the second one, it will be like this. One minus the probability of healthy classes, one by two whole square, minus the probability of healthy uh, COVID class is one by two whole square. And it will be like uh, 0 0.5. So what I am trying to show you that if your node is completely pure, that means there is only one type of class that we want that, like I said in the previous slide, that we want our nodes to be as much pure as possible. So if our node is very pure or completely pure, the value of the Gini index will be zero. And if our node is completely impure, you see in this node, uh, there is a 50-50 chance of everything. There is one healthy, one COVID. That means this is the highest level of impurity we can achieve. So when the case is like this, our node is very impure, uh, the range, the value of the Gini index will be 0 0.50. That means the range of this Gini index will be always from zero to 0 0.5, where zero means the node is very pure and 0 0.5 means it's very impure.
that's what I want you to understand from this slide. And if we really understand what is this Guinea index, the rest of our uh, decision tree implementation is almost easy. So this is how we do. At the beginning, I, I mean, if you think about uh, this data, uh, this data. So at the beginning, before we ask any question, there are two healthy people and three COVID people. So what will be the Guinea index of this? So if we, uh, sorry. Uh, if we measure the Guinea index of this node, you see it's almost 50-50. So the Guinea index of this node will be probably, I am not going to calculate it, but uh, probably it will be like 0 0.40 or something because it's almost uh, perfectly impure, not pure. So maybe, maybe it's possible it will be like this. But after we have asked them some question, ask our data some question and dividing our root node into this following two child node to see completely pure and this node is zero because it's completely pure. That means uh, by asking this question, we have been able to reduce our impurity of total of overall of our decision tree to zero. At the beginning, we have Guinea index of 0 0.40 and it was uh, highly impure. And after dividing our uh, root node or after dividing our data set uh, using some question, we have been able to reduce our uh, impurity from 0 0.40 to zero, which is completely pure. So in uh, each step of decision tree learning algorithm, we try to do this same thing. We try to ask our data some question and based on the question, we try to divide our data set until each leaf node is actually pure, completely pure or almost pure. This is like a, a while loop or a recursion that until all leaf nodes are pure, we will keep dividing our data set by asking some question and dividing that nodes. So I want to uh, run a just simple example, a little, um, uh, bigger example. Uh, see, here is a, another very uh, simple data. Okay. So here we have three features. First one is chest pain, whether some patient has chest pain or not, then whether the patient has good blood circulation or not. And the third feature is like whether the patient has blocked arteries or not. Depending on these three features only, we, are, we will try to predict or develop a decision tree learning algorithm that will predict whether the patient has heart disease or not. So what we do actually in the beginning, suppose before dividing our data set into anything, in the beginning, we have two samples who don't have heart disease. So we have two samples who don't have heart disease and we have two samples who actually have heart disease. So yes, two. So you see, this is a completely impure node because two of them doesn't have heart disease, two of them has heart disease. So 50-50 chance of everything. So the Guinea index will be maybe, not maybe, definitely 0 0.5, the highest level of impurity. Now we will try to divide this data set by asking them some question. Now, what question can we ask? We have to ask question depending on the features we have. So first of all, we have a feature called chest pain. So we may ask that whether this patient has chest pain or not. Suppose this is the question that we will use, whether the patient has chest pain or not. So yes or no, yes or no. So if they have chest pain, so see, if they have chest pain, the answers where the answer is, uh, such uh, rows where the answer is yes, among them, two have heart disease and one doesn't have heart disease. So no will be one, there is only one sample who has no, and there is two samples who has heart disease. And for those who don't have chest pain, there is only one sample and uh, he doesn't have heart disease. So 
yes will be zero. There is no cases of heart disease and no will be one. There is only one cases of heart disease. So if we divide our data set, depending on this chest pain question, you see, we get one pure null. So the algorithm will run like this. Uh, if a new patient comes, if uh, the patient don't have chest pain, so the algorithm will take them to this node and here 100% of them are healthy. So our algorithm will predict they are healthy. But uh, if they have chest pain, they, our algorithm will take them to this node. And since uh, most of the majority of the uh, samples of this node actually has heart disease, our algorithm will predict that they have heart disease. Now that's not all because we have other two features. So what can we do to them? So what we actually do is that we try all these three different features. For example, in the first time we tried chest pain and divided our algorithm or divided our data set into these two nodes. And then we, com we will compute the Gini index of these two child nodes. Similarly, like the equation I showed you, maybe the Gini index we will get after dividing the data set using chest pain, uh, suppose 0 0.40, uh, just for example. Then we will again divide our data set using this feature, the second feature. So here the same, yes or no. And maybe after calculating the Gini index again, we will see that the Gini index, if we divide our data set using the uh, block artery feature, maybe we will get uh, an index of zero. Then we will try the third feature. Uh, for example, we will again divide the data set using whether they, are block they have blocked arteries or not. If the answer is yes, we will get a child node. If the answer is no, we will get another child node. So we will compute the Gini index of these child nodes again. And suppose the Gini index will be, if we use the, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, this one will be uh, circulation, good circulation. And this one will be blocked arteries. Suppose the green index will be 0 0.30. So what we have done, we started with all the data. This is our root node. And we have checked each three features. We have divided our data set three times. And each time we tried three individual features. And each of that time we measured their Gini index. So what we do, we'll select the feature that can reduce our Gini index to the lowest. That means we will select that feature that can make our nodes more pure. So since we have seen that out of these three features, uh, this uh, circulation feature, that means good circulation feature can actually reduce our impurity from 0 0.50 to 0. That means completely impure to completely pure. So definitely we will divide our data set using this feature first. Sorry, this feature first. That is the idea of uh, how decision tree works. Now, if I generalize a little bit, I'm just keeping all the calculation. Uh, what happens is that it's actually, Suppose you have some data set. And in this data set, you have suppose five or four features, say four feature, one, two, three, four. Suppose this is your data set and you have your target levels as well. So what we do is that we start with all the samples first. At the beginning, there will be all the samples in our root node. Then, we try out all these four features individually again and again to see which feature divides our data and reduce our impurity most. Suppose in the first run, this feature number one divides our data and reduce our impurity uh, to the most. So what we do, we just split our data using this feature one. So here we have split our data using this feature one. Next, what we do is that we consider these two child nodes as a parent node. That means we start our same algorithm from this node. And we try to we will try to divide this node using all four features again and see which feature reduce our impurity most. Suppose uh, in this case, uh, feature four could reduce our impurity most. So here you will use feature four 
to divide our data set. And for this node also, we'll do the same thing. Uh, or suppose in this node, it was actually completely pure. Suppose after dividing using the first feature, maybe this right child node was completely pure. So since it's completely pure, we don't need to divide it anymore. So we'll just leave them alone and we'll work on this left child node. And in the left child node, after trying out each four features, we saw that feature number four uh, was uh, able to reduce the impurity the most. So we'll divide our data set using this feature number four. Now, suppose after dividing that, uh, this node was completely pure, for example. So we don't need to do anything with this node. So we'll start working on this node again. And on this node, we'll try again all these four different features and try to divide it and see which one can reduce our impurity more. Suppose here, feature number three work better. So we'll do the same thing again, that feature number three divide these nodes. And after dividing this, maybe this one is pure, this one is also pure. So now you see all the leaf nodes are pure after the, uh, asking question number one, question number four, and question number three. So our decision tree algorithm is complete. So if some new data come, for example, if some uh, new data come with four features, one, two, three, four, what our decision tree learning algorithm will do is that first it will, it will ask question based on this feature, question number one. Uh, since this is the first feature that we divided our data with. So depending on the answer, our patient uh, may go to here or here. If go to here, so it's a pure node, so it will classify whatever class is in it. And if it's here, uh, it will ask again question number four. So depending on the answer of the question number four, it will get either in this node or this node. And since all these two nodes are pure, so the prediction will be whatever class in these two nodes. So this is like a recursion or like a while loop. We'll keep dividing our Sample. So we'll start with all the samples at the beginning. Then at each step, we'll try all these four features and see which feature can divide our data set and make them most pure. And we'll keep doing that until all of our leave nodes are actually pure. And then our decision tree learning algorithm will end. So <clears throat> this is the overall process of building a decision tree. Now, there is some uh, problems that might happen during building this decision tree, because uh, you see, if we keep uh, increasing this length of tree more and more, I mean, unchecked. So what might happen is that, uh, for example, if I show you a little simulation, uh, for example, suppose this cross circles are one class and this pure circle are some different class. Uh, so what decision uh, tree learning algorithm is does that it first ask a question on this feature one. So if the answer of the feature one is less than this, uh, the decision tree algorithm will predict this cross class. And if more than this value, our decision learning algorithm will predict this pure circle class. Now, if we keep dividing or if we keep increasing uh, the nodes or the tree, a uh, decision tree learning algorithm will have specific rules for each of these data. I mean, decision learning algorithm will keep dividing it. We'll keep dividing it and we'll keep, uh, we'll make individual rules for each of our data. So this is not what we want because if this happened, suppose in here, what happened is that our decision tree algorithm has made a separate rule for each of our sample. Now, if a new data comes, for example, and that, that data falls here, like in this place, you see uh, our algorithm will not give a very uh, good result because uh, our algorithm is now much focused on the data that we have supplied. You can think of this like this, that we have made actually just a if else based rule or a rule based algorithm. So if we supply them or if we try to predict some data that this model has not seen before, uh, our model won't be able to predict with uh, good accuracy. So this kind of uh, phenomena is called overfitting, that our model has become highly complex. It has memorized all our data and it doesn't have any predicted power, predictive power. So this kind of uh, situation or where our model becomes too much complex and loses its ability to predict uh, new data is called overfitting. So we have to avoid this kind of situation. And for that, what we do 
is that we select some kind of criteria for stopping our decision tree learning algorithm. One of them is like this. For example, if we say that, that the maximum depth of our tree will be two. So what, what will happen that after, I mean, creating uh, this two levels, our decision tree learning algorithm will stop. I mean, it will not divide our trees anymore. And another thing to do is to minim, uh, define a minimum number of element in the leaf node. That means if we say, if you say that if in some leaf node, there is only five element, no matter is it, if it is pure or not, we will not divide it further. So these two are just some uh, options to limit the depth of our all of our data so that it loses its predictive power. So these two criterion, actually decision tree have many criterion to stop this kind of overfitting, but these two are uh, beginner friendly and easy to use. So that's why I have shown you this one. So that's uh, all about building a decision tree, how we can build a decision tree. We'll have our data will at the beginning of the root node of our tree, we'll start with all our sample and then we'll just keep dividing the samples uh, with the features that make them more pure. And we continue to do that. There is some possibility that our model will become increasingly uh, complex and lose its predictive power. So what will we do? We define some stopping criteria. That means we say that maybe after uh, three or four level, we don't want, want our tree to grow any much longer. Or we set some rules that if some node leaf node has five or 10 elements, we will not divide it further. So by this kind of criteria, we can stop uh, making an over complex model. So this is uh, what uh, decision tree algorithm, how we can develop it. And next, uh, there is uh, just some simple, not simple, actually, there is a whole lot of books on this kind of techniques, but I'll try to uh, just give an overall very simplified view of what these things are. So this topic actually falls into what we call ensemble learning. Ensemble learning is all about combining multiple models together. For example, uh, previously we saw how to uh, make only one single decision tree. But what we can do is that we can make uh, multiple decision tree on the same data. So uh, suppose uh, in the same data set, we uh, build 100 decision trees. And what we do actually, suppose we have 100 uh, decision tree, one, two, three, dot, 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 100. Suppose we have 100 decision tree models on the same data set. And uh, what we do is that this all individual decision tree predicts something. Suppose it predicts yes, it predicts yes. Maybe it predicts no. Maybe it will predict yes. So our final prediction will be the majority of the predictions. Because you see, out of this 100 uh, decision tree models, maybe uh, 90 of them predicted yes, and only 10 of them predicted no. So uh, we will just since the majority of classes are yes, we'll predict yes, he will develop a heart disease. So what is the uh, reason for doing this is that overall uh, making a hundred decision tree gives you a more predictive power. And what bagging does, actually this part is called the random forest. Because uh, previously we built only one single decision tree. Now we are combining multiple decision trees to make a forest. That's the forest part of this name comes from. So random forest and where the uh, name random comes from, it comes from like this. If this is your complete data, like this is all of your data that you are trying to build a model with, the random part actually comes from this, that in the first model, uh, suppose you have 1000 data. So in the first model, we will build a model by randomly selecting, selecting say 200 data from it. And in the second model, we will again randomly select 200 data from it. 
and like this in the 100 model we will randomly select 200 data, uh, 200 data from it and we will build decision tree on this individual part of this data so that's where the random part comes from of this random forest so there is a, another advantage of this random forest that is see if this is the overall composition of your data set now maybe on this data you have built an, one model in this data maybe you have built another model model number two in this data you have built another model and in this data you have we are building separate decision trees on each of them. So uh, it happens that uh, maybe, maybe uh, a single decision tree algorithm in this overall data set wouldn't work much better. Maybe it would give you some error because it's hard for a single decision tree to model this overall data. But if we build multiple decision tree for multiple small part of the data, it actually gives you a very higher predicted power and very high performance. And there are other advantages that maybe you can, you can explore in textbooks, but uh, overall uh, reason for this kind of ensemble learning is actually this. We combine multiple models trained on multiple different parts of our data. And during the final prediction, we combine all the results of all the model that we have built. So. Uh, in uh, simple words, it gives a uh, very less uh, chance of making mistakes because uh, maybe it, uh, uh, actually we build uh, over thousands of decision tree in a random forest. So even if uh, 100 or 200 of your model actually make mistakes, 800 models will actually give you the correct result. So there is a very less chance of uh, making mistakes if you use a random forest with uh, this bagging method. And this whole overall process is called the ensemble learning. I hope if you haven't heard about it, you will definitely explore because decision tree or tree-based algorithms on its own uh, doesn't perform much better. Obviously it's just state of the art, but uh, still it has some limitations. But if you combine multiple decision trees using multiple ensemble learning methods and give a final prediction by considering all of the results of all of the models, so it will give you the actual state of the art part, part performance. So uh, it's uh, definitely you should try out uh, ensemble learning methods, especially uh, bagging and random forest whenever you are trying to model any tabular data. So that is the part of the machine learning algorithms that I wanted you to teach, uh, the decision tree and random forest. I have shown you how to develop it and how to avoid overfitting and all this kind of things. Then I will very simply uh, cover how to train our model. So the first part of training our model is to split the data between training and testing. So suppose we have 1000 data. So we will uh, first split our data into a test set and another for training set. Now, why we do that? We do that because the main part or the main goal of any machine learning algorithm, if you want to implement in real life scenario is the generalization capability. Generalization. Generalization means how good your model can predict on the data that your model has not seen yet. Because like I showed you, if you let your decision tree algorithm extend unchecked, it has the ability to memorize all of the data. I mean, to create a if else rules for all of these samples. Now, if you evaluate your model based on that data, obviously it will give you a hundred percent accuracy, but in the real life, where there is too much uncertainty, and obviously there will be some data that your model has not seen before, it will not perform up to your expectation. Uh, during the training model, you, you will see that you have 100% accuracy, but when you uh, actually implement it in real life, you will see that uh, the accuracy level drops to 50%, 60%, because uh, your model has never seen the real life data. So how can we measure that uh, our model will perform better in real life? We have no way to do that until we deploy our model. But to still mimic the real world scenario, what we do is that we, uh, we separate at least 80% of data for this evaluation person uh, purpose alone. And this is done at the beginning of the analysis and our model never uh, see this data set 
until our model is complete. So what we do is that actually build our model using this training data. Suppose we have 800 training data, we will build our model using this training data. And once our model is complete, once our model is complete, we will evaluate our model on this test data to give our stakeholders a overall uh, understanding or a sense of understanding that how well it might perform in the real life. So this test data is actually mimicking the real life scenario, even though it's not actually a complementary of real life uh, data, it can never be, but still it's better than testing on this train data that our model has already seen. So that's why we actually do this train test split before our uh, training process. And next, the cross-validation, there is multiple part in this uh, uh, line. So first one is scaffold, second one is stratified, and the third one is cross-validation. So I will come to stratified first, what is stratification? So in the previous example, where we are trying to classify between uh, whether some person will develop heart disease or not, so there was only two possible class, yes or no, yes or no. So the problem is, uh, when we divide our data randomly into training and test set, so uh, just uh, for example, say in this data set, the number of yes class was 900 and number of no class was 100. And we divided this data into training and test set. Randomly, you just randomly select 80% data for the training 20% data for the test. So what might happen is that by chance, by your bad luck, these 100 no classes might fall completely into your test set. That means your test set will, will be composed of now 100 yes plus 100 no. I mean, all of the classes who didn't have heart disease will fall into test data. But in your train data, this all 800 data will have actually heart disease. So what happened is that since you will train your model using this train data, your model will never know what these people, what these patients look like. So your model have, will have no idea how to predict this class. So your model will not work. So to prevent this thing from happening, we do stratified sampling. Stratified sampling ensure that in these two splits, each of the classes is equally distributed. That means if you use this stratified splitting after this uh, split, the training uh, data will have say uh, 50 no classes and the train data will have also have 50 no classes. It just uh, makes sure that both these splits get equal distribution of each of these classes. So the others will be maybe it will have 700 years and it will have 50 years like this. It makes a equal distribution. So this is the stratified part uh, comes from. Then I will go to this cross validation. Why we do cross validation? For example, let's say this is our data set. So in cross validation, uh, K fold cross validation, suppose K is actually variable. Suppose we say the value of K is five. This is what we can set during uh, training, the value of K, this is up to us, how much uh, the value of K will be. Suppose we have set the value of K to be five. So in this case, we divide our total data set into five parts. We divide our total data set. Actually, this is the training data set. Since we are training and we are always training with the training set. So we are dividing our training data set into five parts for five and then what we do at the first step we keep four parts for training then we build a model using this four part and using the fifth part we check the performance of our model this is uh, some way uh, to measure how well our trees are being built during the model training process. So in five-fold cross-validation, 
since the value of k is 5 uh, so these things happen for five times in the first times we build a model using the first four feature and we test with the fifth feature in the second time uh, suppose we build a model with the last four features and test with the first feature in the fourth time suppose we build a model with one two three and fifth feature and test with the four feature like this like this combination we uh, keep uh, like 80 percent of our data for modeling and less uh, last 20 percent for uh, validating that our model is actually learning what we are trying to do so that's is the reason of uh, cross validation and that is k4 uh, comes from how many uh, uh, how uh, how many uh, components that you want to divide your data into so if you make the value of k equal to 10 so your data will be divided into 10 and your modeling will run 10 times in each time uh, the model will be built on nine uh, nine of your parts and the rest one part will be used to validate your model so this is uh, one of the best practices of uh, uh, building or training a machine learning model and after we have uh, modeled or built a model uh, we have to evaluate how good our model is performing so there is uh, many metrics that you, you can use to evaluate your model so the first thing that we usually do is to build a confusion matrix what uh, confusion matrix actually does is that it has uh, two rows and two columns in the columns we have the actual values actual values and in the rows we have the predicted values so suppose some has heart disease some we don't have heart disease and we predicted heart disease and we predicted no heart disease what it actually means is like this the columns are actual value this yes means they actually had heart disease this no means they actually didn't have heart disease and these rows are the predicted values this y means we predicted that they have heart disease and this no means we predicted that uh, they don't have heart disease so suppose uh, we have found out that uh, the uh, this uh, the value of this cell is 50 the value of this cell is suppose 70 this one is 5 this one is 7 what it actually means is that uh, we correctly classified 50 people who had heart disease actually and our model also predicted that they had actually heart disease so we can call this uh, value true positive that is they actually have heart disease and our model also predicted that they have heart disease and like this one they actually didn't have heart disease our model also predicted they don't have heart disease so we can call them true negatives true negatives and this one see they actually didn't have heart disease no but our model predicted that they have heart disease so that is actually false positive and in this cell actually they had heart disease but we said our model said no they don't have heart disease so actually false negative so this is one of the ways to evaluate our model how our model is performing and other than this of course there is a uh, uh, matrix called accuracy that means suppose you have total 100 data and out of them you correctly classified 75 of them so you have 75 percent accuracy it's almost easy so nothing to explain here and there are other other metrics for example precision recall that you should explore uh, sensitivity then specificity uh, you should explore this kind of metrics and they give you a more fine-grained view of your algorithm so mostly we'll be uh, using this accuracy and confusion matrix here and others i uh, hope you will explore by yourself so that's overall uh, all relating to this uh, model building, uh, implementing a decision tree, uh, training a decision tree, and evaluating a decision tree. So now I will do a little uh, hands-on to show you the codes. 
so I hope some of you at least have installed Anaconda and I hope some of you at least have downloaded uh, the files. So in the checkbox, okay. So let me share the code. So those who have uh, installed Anaconda, you just uh, open the Anaconda and go to the uh, Jupyter Notebook. So it might take a small time. So launch Jupyter Notebook from Anaconda and just go to the file. For example, I have kept the file in desktop workshop, this model.ipython notebook. So you can run this cell. Uh, since I have seen that almost everyone of, oh no, but most of you have some uh, knowledge about Python and some of you have uh, knowledge about scientific Python uh, computing. So actually, it I hope it will be easy. So this is the cell where I have imported all the imported all the libraries necessary for building decision tree. And this is the uh, this is the library that I want you to explore. Light GBM. This is actually for building a, a random forest. This library is built by probably Microsoft, and this is very powerful. This is very efficient library for building and almost the best for building a random forest algorithm. And this is the SHAP library that I will explain later. Other than this, other than this, uh, NumPy, Pandas, Matlab, Matplotlib, they are just these are just uh, the main libraries to make uh, for scientific computing in Python. So I want you to explore since this coding purpose is really out of scope of this workshop. So I I, I have uh, provided with the code. So I want you to explore on yourself, but still I will show you uh, the results. The first uh, in this line, I have loaded the data set. And by this uh, info function, I just want to know uh, some information about my columns. I mean, what are the features of uh, my data? What are the data types and this kind of things? You see the name of the columns is this. So we have some information about the gender, marital status, age, BMI, place of residence, family size, income level, etc. cetera, uh, whether they do exercise or not. This is actually a COVID related data set. They are working from home or not, their education level, whether they maintain social distancing or not, whether they have been infected with COVID or they have uh, COVID infection risk, they work in a risky environments. Uh, then some uh, mental uh, health issues, like whether they have an anxiety, whether uh, what is their sleep schedule, whether they have any difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, sleep problems, sleep pattern, et cetera. And the target of this data is uh, mainly insomnia. So what we are trying to do is that we are trying to predict whether our uh, patient will uh, have ins uh, insomnia or not. Now, insomnia, uh, research uh, about 40 to 30 percent of the people who suffered from covid actually developed some form of insomnia uh, at some point and it's a very and according to the research it is uh, the second most uh, mental problem in this uh, world but it is also the mostly overlooked problem uh, because nobody cares about it but still it is one of the most important thing because uh, <clears throat> conditions like uh, diabetes cancer, even cancer, and this kind of serious uh, health issues have been uh, linked with insomnia uh, directly or indirectly. So our task is appointment with your doctor, it needs time. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to predict whether some patient has insomnia or not using this uh, features or the survey alone so that we uh, our patients don't have to wait too much or in the remote areas maybe there there is a 
doctors who can uh, detect insomnia. So for this kind of reason, maybe just uh, for example, we are trying to develop a machine learning model that can predict insomnia. So here I have just explored our data set. For example, uh, out of the all the samples, 500, almost 500 are males, uh, 386 are females. So these are just explore, data exploration that is not necessary. You will explore yourself. All the course have been given. So you see in the target value, uh, 570 actually have insomnia. One means positive, that means insomnia, and 375 uh, patients don't have insomnia. And this is our data. We have explored our data. We have understood what this data is, what is our task. Now, like I showed you, the first task is to uh, divide our data set into train and test pit. So this is the function I have imported uh, from the libraries. So this is the train test pit function comes from the Python's sklearn library. I have uh, put the shuffle parameter to true because I want to split the samples randomly. And then I have uh, used the parameter stratify equal to y. That means I want to stratify our splitting based on our target variable. That means I want that in the train and test data, I want the equal distribution of patients who have insomnia and who doesn't have insomnia. And then I have defined that test size that is 10% of the data, you could have given 20% or depend on how much data you have. So after uh, dividing the data, see for the training purpose, I have 850 uh, samples and for the test purpose, I have 95 samples. So that is the train and test split part. Then we have to define our model. So at first, you see, I have uh, made a stratified K fold class. What it does, it uh, like I show you during the cross validation slide that it uh, divide our data set into five parts, and during the training, it supplies four of the five parts for training and the rest one part for validation. So that part is done by this class, stratified K fold class, and this CLF variable, that means classifier variable, is our actual classifier. It's been it's actually a class from the LightGBM library. And the class is the LGBM classifier. Uh, actually, if you, uh, I have given link to this library, and if you visit the documentation, you will see that there is lots and lots of parameters that you can explore. But I have kept uh, very simple that our objective is binary classification. Since we are trying to predict whether someone will develop insomnia or not, yes or no, so it's a binary classification. Uh, boosting type, uh, gradient descent boosting is out of the scope to uh, uh, make you understand. Is unbalanced equal to true because uh, our class distribution is not totally unbalanced. We have 570 people who have insomnia and 375 people who does not have insomnia. So it's a little imbalance. So to account for that, uh, uh, like GBN do some kind of optimization to account for that. And then maximum depth, you see, like I showed, max, but maximum depth equal to minus one means I have allowed the tree to grow as much as they want. Minus one or negative means uh, we are not giving any checkpoints. So if you uh, put here a positive number, suppose 10, so that means after 10 levels, your tree will stop going and the algorithm will stop. But I have let, uh, I have allowed my tree to go infinitely. Then number of leaves. This is the maximum of, uh, number of leaves that I can allow or allow on any samples. Uh, uh, this is the maximum number of leaf, leaf nodes. So this kind of uh, uh, the reason of using this kind of parameter is uh, you can find this from uh, documentations. So number of estimators, since it's a random forest classifier, that means we are building multiple trees. So this model actually, this parameter actually defines how many trees you want to build. So I, I want to build 1000 trees on this data. So minimum split gain, that means uh, I will not consider the features that cannot reduce impurity uh, more than 0 0.1. If some feature can reduce impurity less than 0 0.1, so I will just ignore it. Again, these parameters are not necessary or uh, not important, but you can try this out. So this is our data. And this part of the code is beyond explaining. You have to see it for yourself, but what it does is do some visualization about our training, uh, this graph. So what has happened here, you see that this is the result of the five training valid, uh, 
steps since we set cross validation or the value of k to be five so our model ran five times on each time the training was done on the four parts and the validation or testing was done on the rest one part and this is the result of each validation for example this blue line is the result of the first training the orange line is the result of second training and so and so and we have uh, measured the precision and recall so precision and recall is another metric of uh, i mean measuring how good your performance is model performance is and we want our precision and recall both to be near 100 so as you can see the average precision here is 0 0.87 so it's actually good not bad so maybe you can do better if you change these parameters or something or add more data maybe you can do better but uh, it's i think good for now and i want you to explore this code uh, because if you see some good research paper they always show this kind of visualization this kind of result of each cross validation and this is this is the uh, graph that they will want to know what happened during your training how good your training was so this is the graph that they want to see so i want you to explore the code and then this is the code for evaluation so on this is actually done on the test data that we kept the 10 percent of the test data that we kept uh, for the testing purpose the evaluation purpose so we are predicting with the test data and comparing how good it performs so you see uh, the true negative are 29 percent true negative 36 percent are true positive like this so this model is actually not good or not completely bad because there are 22 false negative results there are 10 false positive results uh, 28 true negative and 35 true positives so not good not bad but again this this was just for example and you can obviously make it better if you uh, Tune, uh, tune these hyper uh, hyperparameters or try multiple parameters on your own. So definitely you can improve much uh, more than this. So this is the part of decision tree. And next, uh, the part of the explainability. What is actually explainability? That is the second part of my uh, lecture today. So the thing is why we even need explainability. So for one purpose that I have, uh, there is a uh, regulation in EU, EU state law that if someone use some automated decision making, I mean, if someone uh, makes some product that give you some service by some automated decision making, as a citizen, you have the right to know what is the logic behind that decision. So that is huge. That is very important. So. Uh, if you make a machine learning model and into deploy and uh, provide service to the people, if the people, if your client wants, they have the right to know based on which, what logic you predicted something for them. So this is just one example why we should uh, be able to explain our AI. And other than this, especially in the health sector, especially in the medical sector, suppose nowadays there are many uh, uh, applications where if you uh, provide them uh, provide the uh, machine learning model with uh, some mri or chest x-ray of you and that will predict whether you have covid or not so this is very common uh, uh, this was a very common research topic uh, during the covid 90 situation and one of a very interesting uh, result an interesting story from it was that some authors tried to come up with this kind of research and they actually predicted this uh, uh, COVID and non-COVID with almost uh, over 99% accuracy. So it was very promising, but upon further scrutinization, it was found that in these X-ray images, there are some numbers, very small numbers inscribed on it, suppose. And for the patients who had COVID, there are some different pattern of number. And for patients who didn't have COVID, there are some other different format of number. So what our what their ML algorithm actually learned is to identify the pattern of this number. They never really looked into the actual X-ray. So when they deployed in the real life, and uh, suppose some chest X-ray data from other hospitals or from other machines from other vendors uh, who didn't have this kind of markings inscribed on it, uh, it performs poorly. I mean, I mean it completely failed. It couldn't. Uh, uh, couldn't classify anything correctly. 
So that's why explainability is important. We don't only uh, need to provide good accuracy, especially in the health and cl clinical decision making. We have to show them that our model is actually learning what it's uh, supposed to learn. So that's why this explainability uh, comes from. Now, there are different kinds of explainable uh, model uh, explainability technique. First one is inherent, uh, inherent and second one is post hoc. So inherent uh, explainable technique is something like our decision tree that we can come up with some this kind of idea that when we split it, our node with some feature, that means this feature was the I mean, this feature has, has the highest capability to reduce the impurity, the first feature. That's what we did. So that means this feature has the highest importance. Similarly, <clears throat> when we divided our data set in the next level, suppose it was with the second feature, that means this second feature maybe has the second highest uh, importance. So this kind of... Uh, measurements that is inherent in these algorithms are actually this inherent type of explainability. If you know something about uh, linear regression, you know that linear regression uh, have an equation like this, that there is some weight multiplied by the value of some feature plus another weight multiplied by the value of another feature. So this, the value of these weights actually defines how this feature interacts with our target. So if you know about linear regression, you would understand. So this value of this W1, which our model learns inherently can be used to explain our model. But the problem is this, that when we built our random forest algorithm, where we used 1000 trees to build a single prediction, that means like this, there were 1000 trees each built upon different parts of our data. How can you make sure, or how can you find out actually which feature contribute in which part or in which way? So you see this kind of inherent techniques of explainability uh, fall short when the model is overly complex or the model is very sophisticated. So that's why we need some kind of post hoc techniques for explainability. Post hoc techniques are actually model independent. That means it doesn't depend on the model. This technique can be used with anything. So this, I, I have shown, I have given one example, one very important example of this kind of uh, post hoc uh, explainability. That is the Shapley values and the SHAP. So what is actually Shap, uh, Shap, uh, Shapley values? So again, I will understand very uh, simply. Suppose you have some coalition of some elements, suppose, this is one element, this is another element, this is another element, and this is another element. And by uh, combining this four element, you get the value of this, suppose. Now what Shapley values computes is the contribution of each of this element on this final value. This is the main understanding of Shapley values. And how does it do it? It does something like this. Suppose we want to measure the contribution of this element to our final value. So what this Shapley values does is that it takes all the combination where this element is present. Suppose this is one combination. And suppose this is another combination. This is another combination. Like this, we can have multiple combination. They uh, take all this combination and it compares with the combination where this value is not present. So this was a combination and here this value will not be present. Similarly like this. And like this, they compare their final values. Suppose in this case, 
in this combination where this our interested element that the element that we are interested was present it has a final value like this and compared to the combination where this value was not present it has a value like this so we say that the marginal contribution of this element on this model is this part this small part we'll just subtract this part from this part and this is the marginal contribution of this element on this model similarly suppose the final value of this combination may be this and the final value of the combination where our inter, uh, our target element was not present that is here maybe suppose this so the contribution here in this model of this feature is this this part similarly we do the same for uh, all the combination and try to measure the contribution of the element that we are interested in uh, compared to the combination where the element is not present and this is called the marginal contribution marginal contribution and after iterating over all this combination we can find the average marginal contribution of this element on our final value we just uh, take the average of this individual marginal combination that we found out during each iteration so average marginal contribution and this as of this value of average marginal uh, contribution is called the shapely values shapely values so now i i hope you can understand how we can use these shapely values in the in machine learning so the way is like this we'll just consider each of these element as the individual features and this final value as our prediction. So we will just measure how much each of our feature contribute to our final prediction. And this shape that is a full, uh, the full abbreviation will be uh, shapely additive explanations. Additive explanation. I have given the link of this library in the uh, first slide. Explanation. This is actually a library, a Python library that some authors built by using this idea of Shapley values. This is actually a concept from game theory. And by using this concept, they have made a library that can measure the contribution of each of the features to our final prediction. Uh, and this is the name of the library of, uh, is called Shap. So how it actually achieves it, or if we if you want to show the see the code, so you see the, the first line I have uh, used a class called shap .tree explainer. This is just the uh, according to the documentation the way the authors have defined defined their API. So if you just uh, follow their documentation and do the same thing, you will get a uh, summary plot. Uh, this is called a B swarm plot. Now it's very interesting and uh, very interesting to interpret. So this is the last thing that I will show you how to interpret the B swarm plot. Now you see in the Y axis, in the Y axis, this is the shape value of each features. This is the shape value of each features. And you have to understand that minus 0 0.5 in the left side of the diagram, it's uh, more uh, prone to negative sides and in the right side is more prone to positive sides. That means the right side is more prone to positive plus. Uh, positive plus means people who develop COVID and the more you go to left, that is uh, the people who didn't develop COVID. One means people Oh, sorry, insomnia. One means people who had insomnia and zero means people who didn't have insomnia. So in this plot, the more the point is towards the positive side, that means these are the people who had uh, insomnia and more the plot is to the negative side, that means these are more prone to uh, uh, being healthy or not developing insomnia. And this all individual points, these all dots, it's actually uh, the uh, 
data of each person. These individual dots are each per person. Uh, and red means, the red color means the value of the feature was high. That means the value of the feature was more towards one. And uh, blue dot means the value of the features were more towards zero. Now, if you want to interpret the first feature, and one more thing that this list of feature is actually sorted according to the importance of those features. So this shape value does, doesn't only give you the most important features, it also tells, uh, tells you how this feature contributes to your model using the shape value. So now if we want to interpret the first uh, feature here, that is say COVID infection equal to no. The name of the feature is uh, COVID infection equal to no. So when the value of COVID infection equal to no is red, that means is high. That means towards one. So that means when the COVID infection equal to no is positive. That means when the people didn't have any COVID infection, our model predicted more towards the class that is uh, near zero. That means it, it just simply means if, uh, the, if the people didn't have any COVID infection, uh, they are less uh, supposed to develop insomnia because you see, again, I, I'm trying to remember you in this X axis, the more uh, uh, the value that more goes towards the uh, positive side, it means uh, the positive class. That means the class with the uh, notation one, that means people who develop insomnia. And the more it go, go towards the negative side, that means it more go towards the value zero. And the value zero means the people who, uh, people who didn't develop insomnia. So like this, if you uh, think about the second feature, job loss equal to no. So if the value of the feature job loss equal to no was high, I mean the people who didn't lose job in the time of the COVID, they were less supposed to develop uh, insomnia. But the people who lost their jobs during COVID, I mean, when the value of this feature was low, blue means low, that means when the value of this feature was false, that means uh, the people who lost their job actually, uh, they were more supposed to develop insomnia. Uh, I will uh, try to interpret another uh, example, another opposite example. For example, this one, place of residence, rural. So you see for those, when the uh, this uh, value of this feature, place of uh, residence uh, equal to uh, rural, the value, when this value was low, blue means low. I mean, when the value of these features was more towards zero, that means uh, the, for people who didn't actually live in rural areas, that means the people who actually live in cities, uh, they were, uh, uh, they, uh, when they actually uh, try, be, uh, lived in rural areas, they were less uh, prone to develop insomnia, but opposite when the value was high, uh, they were more prone to uh, develop insomnia. So like this, uh, this, this is the part that explainability uh, comes from, that our model is actually learning something. It's not just uh, randomly guessing or it's not uh, randomly selecting a feature that has no importance uh, over our final prediction. Uh, so especially in the clinical data, when you show this kind of uh, explanation uh, and show them uh, that uh, our model is actually uh, coming up with, with some important rules, so it makes them more trustworthy. And not only that, it also give you some uh, more ideas to research on. For example, if you see that <clears throat> those who didn't uh, lose their jobs uh, were uh, less prone to develop insomnia and those who lose their job uh, were more prone to develop insomnia, maybe you can take this idea to uh, research further deeply into it. Uh, because uh, like I said, machine learning model doesn't care greatly about the importance of relationship between two variables. So uh, when you, uh, uh, come up if you come up with this kind of uh, ideas or this kind of uh, explanation and you will get some uh, new insights from our data when this is the uh, 
knowledge that our machine learning algorithm has learned if you had not tried to explain the model you would never know that this kind of relationship actually exists in the, your machine learning model so this is also uh, good for knowledge mining so we are not only teaching our uh, computers to learn something and predict something we are also learning from them uh, we are teaching them something and then we are again learning from something and we are learning them uh, learning from them that what they have learned so this is a two way process and i want you to explore this topic because shapley values and shap are very uh, uh, imp uh, important and very extensive topics so I want you to explore further. Again, the codes have been given and I have tried to explain the most basic part of this uh, Shapley values. And uh, if you want to dive further, uh, some uh, cautions al although, because the recently, uh, one thing that you have to understand that this kind of explainability is actually a model level explainability because after you have run a complete model, after you have evaluated a model on the complete data set, then you are getting this kind of uh, knowledge. But it's not the same for each individual decision. I mean, if, a, uh, if some individual person comes to you and they want to measure whether they have insomnia or not, you cannot really, you can, but not at that accuracy, really measure that uh, reason behind each individual uh, prediction. So this is one lackings of this uh, explainable AI or SHAP values, but still, it's better than nothing. It still is better than nothing. And that's, uh, I mean, still there is some scope of research on this explainability. And if you want to dive further into this explainability topic, I have given you a link, this interpretable machine learning, a guide for making black box model explainable. It's actually an online book. It's very thorough and you have, you will have all the things that you need to understand from or about this explainability or interpretability of these machine learning models. So that is overall that I wanted you to show. I think you might have many questions because in some part I covered it very quickly. So if you have any questions, you may ask me now. I will try to clarify. Maybe for our audience, if you wanna ask questions, you can write in the chat or you can raise your hand. Just a moment, please. Oh, first question we have from Miss Abigail Aceda. Yeah. Can you hear my, my theory? Yes, I can hear it. I'm from Indonesia, Mr. Musabia. My name is Azeda. I am student of graphic design study program at State Community University in Indonesia. I really appreciate that you present your material very complex and clearly with lots of examples and questions, also calculations. It helps us understand the material well. On page 22 on your presentation, it is explained about keyboard stratified cross-validation. You also explain about evaluation um, metrics by the Anaconda programming. It's really clear about how to calculate the correlation between the cross-validation test harness and an ideal uh, test conditions and how do we know what value of K to use when evaluating model on our own data set? I can choose the K value is five or 10, but how do we know this makes sense for our data set? Thank uh, you. The answer, uh, thank you for your question, but the answer for this actually, uh, these values of K, like uh, the loss validation value of K, these are actually called hyperparameters. That means the parameters that we have to choose our self. That is not the model will optimize uh, oh. hyper hyperparameters. And during this kind of hyperparameter selection, there is no clear guide about uh, what value you can select. So the best thing that we do is that we select uh, at least two or three values for this kind of hyperparameters and try to check which one works better. And another thing for this is that since uh, the K value is mostly for dividing our data set, so it's uh, some uh, case that you can make is that suppose you, if you have 1000 data and if you use a K value of five, that means your data will be divided into five parts. That means during each modeling, you will have 800 data for training and 200 data for testing. So, but if you make K equal to 
10. So then you will have suppose 900 data from training and only 100 data for testing. So if you think that you will need a little more data for testing, so you make the case value equal to five. But if you think that, okay, uh, K equal to 10 and making 100 data available for testing is good enough. So then you can make the value K equal to 10. But again, this depends on the type of the data you are using and it depends on how many data you have. If you have normally in machine learning algorithm, what we have is that you have around 10,000 data. So in that case, if you use the value K equal to even 100, maybe you will have at least 100 data for testing. So it will be still okay. Hmm. Although not okay, because you will have 100 model to run, it will be computational. Just to give you an example, that it actually depends on the amount of data you have. If you have 100 data and make it uh, in full cross validation, you will have only 10 data for testing, which is, will be not enough. That's how you will have develop an idea because in machine learning we'll keep working with the same data set again and again and gradually you will develop an idea that what will be the actual value of k okay thank you so much for your answer sir thank you yeah and the next question we have in the chat from utimil anjani yeah I will ask if the algorithm can be used also to predict the heritage way this is from their family. Maybe it will also use the broad groups and also hormones data. Uh, hereditary disease from their family, maybe it will also use the yeah. blood group and also hormones data. Uh, yes, you can, uh, but it uh, actually, uh, if you have enough data and if you can generate the actual features, maybe you can, but I'm not too sure about hereditary disease because I'm not sure about the data set, how it looks like. But if, like I, uh, what kind of data that I showed, the tabular data where you have multiple features and <clears throat> those features have some direct or indirect relationship with our target. So if you have uh, some features that have direct or indirect relationship with some hereditary disease, yeah, I think it definitely should be able to model that disease. And maybe it will also use the blood group and also, yes, uh, you can uh, combine multiple data, uh, multiple features into a table and the corresponding targets. And at least you can give it a try. No one knows what uh, new information you can uh, come up with. Uh, I think your uh, speaker is silent, so. Yeah, sorry. yeah, and the second question is from Nahia Bagasporo. Can the Air Torrent be combined with a startup software for various fields during the pandemic? Uh, sorry to say, I have no idea about Air Torrent. What is it? Okay, so okay. maybe we can. Uh, next question. Is it okay? And then in a room chat from Muhammad, what is an effective way to introduce air to our young generation? So oh. it is in, yeah. What is actually AIR? Can you clarify? Can anyone clarify? This is for from our student. Maybe. Oh, maybe we can go to the last question also. Yeah, from, yeah, what are the negative impact of using all technology in the future? Well, that's a, a very philosophical question. And uh, okay. the way I think, uh, the way I felt that uh, some people uh, doesn't really appreciate what is actually AI. Uh, some people think that uh, some people think it's very positively they are too much positive about ai and some people are completely negative but actually uh, very few people who have actual understanding of ai so that's one negative side and when you have too much positivity on something uh, you might uh, try to ignore their shortcomings and when you have too much negativity about something you might ignore uh, their scopes or possibilities and one thing i have also thought about is that suppose 
uh, if you continue to use machine learning to uh, make our task easy, so is it possible that we might evolve into something less? Uh, I mean, uh, will our uh, the function of brain will be negatively affected or not? So I, I don't uh, actually I can give a clear answer, but it's a very philosophical question. And there are lots of debates going on it. They have both groups of people who have different views and they have uh, different but very convincing arguments. So it's an ongoing debate. So it's difficult to say something clearly, but definitely we should try. Definitely we should try to build machine learning model and try to integrate in uh, try at least we, we should try because uh, if we don't try, we won't never know how, what are the scopes uh, there. So that's what some vague answer, but uh, honestly, it's very difficult to say. Okay, it's okay. I think we don't have no more questions. Can we go to in a closing session? Oh, oh. okay. Thank you for. Mr. Musabir Samak is uh, sharing your knowledge with us. It's uh, very beneficial for all our audience. Can we take a picture together for a documentation maybe? Yeah, sure. Okay, just a moment. May I request you all to turn on your camera to take a photo? Okay. Yeah, just a moment. Yeah. Maybe for our audience, you can turn off your camera. Turn on, sorry. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for Mr. Musabir Samak. I think we can meet again in other event in the future. Thank you for joining in this event with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you soon again.